is why your wife was crying at the airport. Hey everybody, this is Ed. I took a little bit of a break here, drank a little bit of water, it's been a long drive. Thought I'd pull off and tell you a little bit about why I do what I do. Um, some people know, some people don't. If you're new to my page and watching on YouTube or Facebook, um, you know, you may not know why I do what I do, why God has called me to do what I do. And uh, many of you know that I was a missionary in Africa for 18 years and we held large open air gospel crusades. We saw millions of people come to the Lord and God do amazing and wonderful things. And then 1999, I started working with the underground church in Vietnam. And uh, that eventually led me to go into Laos. One of the pastors that I uh, was connected with in Vietnam asked me if I'd come to Laos. And Laos was a lot tougher and far more difficult place to get into. And uh, I felt a witness in my heart that I was supposed to go to Laos. And I told him I would. And I'd get back in touch with him. And, and after I sought the Lord and prayed about it, way to do it so you know I was praying about it and I said God I know you got a strategy I know you've got a way to do it I just don't know what it is and I'm trusting that you'll help me and you'll give me a plan on how to do it so sure enough the Lord began to deal with my heart and he said uh, I want you to go to Thailand and buy a motorcycle and use that to slip into laps and uh, I didn't realize the insight and the wisdom at the time, but I, it fi I figured it out once I got into Laos, you know, with my helmet on and my visor and, and just on a bike, I probably look like any other person on Laos. Most 90% travel by, you know, motorcycle, moped. And so I could slip around to the country pretty much unnoticed and not array arise any type of suspicion at all from the authorities. And uh, so that's what I began to do, begin preparation. Now, I have to tell you interesting and a rather funny story. I'm not a motorcycle guy. I did grow up riding motorcycles. My one experience on a mini bike was a friend of mine let me ride his mini bike. I was eight years old. I rode it into a tree and busted it up. And that's about my experience, other than being on vacation with my wife and sitting on the back of a moped in Mexico, you know, riding around. But I, I never really had any experience of riding a bike. And uh, but I knew God would help me and give me the wisdom. And I had friends that would advise me and teach me and and train me so as I was going through this process of getting the bike and picking out what kind of bike and, and asking people that had traveled that part of the world before what they would recommend and we purchased the bike in Thailand through a friend of mine uh, and uh, the bike was all ready we had it modified engine plate put on a rack put on so I could carry my luggage and, and, and go longer distances and, and uh, I had a friend in North Carolina, and uh, he told me um, that uh, he would teach me how to ride. Uh, he, he's a big bike guy. Uh, he's got uh, street bikes, off-road bikes. So uh, he told me that uh, whenever I got up there to preach, which was usually almost every year, that I, would, I could come and see him, and that uh, he would you know, spend a week or two with him, and he would teach me and take me out. And that by the time I got to Laos, I'd be fine. I'd be an experienced rider and I could get by. And I thought, you know, great, you know, that'd be fantastic, you know. And uh, Mark Redwine, if you're watching this, thank you for the offer, buddy. I, I, too bad it didn't work out. But that year I didn't uh, get invited to preach in North Carolina. And so I, I did manage to hook up with him so he could teach me. So, uh, and this is going back uh, seven, seven, eight years ago. So I thought, okay, well, uh, I'll contact a bunch of motorcycle schools in Florida, South Florida, where I live, and sign up and, and take a course and learn what I need to learn. And when I get to get to uh, you know Thailand, and I'll get on my bike and head off into Laos. Well, at that time, gas had gone up to almost four dollars a gallon. College students were getting mopeds, people were getting motorcycles, and all the schools were booked. I couldn't get in. Well. I didn't know what to do, and, and the guy that I had contacted over here in Thailand, an Australian guy, he put the rack on my bike so I could carry extra equipment, and I contacted him, and he said, Ed, do not worry about this. When you get over here, I'll take you out. I'll teach you how to ride. You'll be fine. It won't take you long to learn, and then you'll be good to go in the Laos. 
So I thanked him and I was, praise God, there's the answer, everything will work out. And um, as soon as I arrived in Chiang Mai, um, I, got, I checked my email and he had a family emergency and he had to go back to Australia. So there's no one to teach me how to ride my bike. So I go to my friend, my car at Zoe Ministries, where we, he helped me purchase the bike and, and stored it there. And so, you know, he, I get the keys to it. And, you know, I, I don't know the first thing. I mean, I don't know about gear shifting, two down, three up, one down. I have no idea. I was surprised the bike had two brakes. I discovered it had a front and a back brake. That's, that's the kind of novice I was. I didn't know anything. So I get on the bike, try to figure this out. First thing I do is I spin out the back tire, lay the bike down to the delight of about 40 orphans who were just rolling on the ground laughing. They thought it was the funniest thing they'd seen a white guy do in a long time. And uh, I didn't mention it, Mike Hart, was a Zoe Ministries, they run an orphanage and they rescue children from the sex trade. So that's where my bike was and that's why I store it when I'm not traveling in laps. And so, man, I tell you, I was like, I was shaking, I was afraid. You know, I could hear the devil say, This is why your wife was crying at the airport. She knows that uh, you're going to kill yourself on this trip. This is the dumbest thing you've ever done. And I could just hear the devil tell me, You're going to die. You're going to die. You know, this is so, such a stupid thing to do. But, uh, you know, I've been following God and listening to his voice, and I know his word well. And so I just kind of prayed. I rebuked fear, told it to get off of me. And I don't, you know, I'm not going to be afraid. Of, I know what God's called me to do. And I just said, Lord, you've always provided wisdom. Your word says that if I need wisdom that ask of you, you'll give it to me liberally. So I just ask you, would you just give me the wisdom I need to, to get on this bike and, and ride it and help me and show me what I need to do? So peace of God came and flooded my heart. I, I picked that bike back up again. No more fear. Got on the bike. And I, I figured a few things out. I, I, you know, I figured out how to get it into gear and, and how to release the cr clutch and and I just tooled down the driveway said goodbye to everybody and the smartest thing I did is I locked my the hotel I was staying at in my GPS or I might still be looking for it today but I made it back to my hotel and I was thankful and look I wasn't Speedy Gonzalez I had old ladies riding side saddle on mopeds passing me but at least I got back to my hotel and uh, at that time eight, eight, eight or so years ago in Chiang Mai at nine o'clock, Chiang Mai was dead. I mean, it, it, there was no activity, no nothing. And there's a loop around what they call the old city. And so I'd take my bike out at night from nine to 12 and practice. I tried to do it at daytime, but you know, when you pop the clutch and you've got about 500 motorcycles behind you, they're not real happy. And so I realized <laughs> that's not a, an environment I need to be in to be practicing. So I'd go out at nighttime and from nine to 12, I'd just go around this five mile loop just getting used to the bike, practicing. No one was out there. If I made a mistake, you know, I wasn't going to hurt anybody. So, and, you know, I, I, if I fell or dropped the bike, it wasn't going to cause a big accident. And after about a week, I, I had a lot of confidence. I felt much better, felt more comfortable around the bike. So I took it up into the northern part of Thailand, which is this, very similar to the area of Laos. I'd be going to a lot of mountains and hills. Had a great time, a few days, and then came back, packed everything up, headed to Laos, went across the border and uh, started making contact with the underground church and ministering to them, their leadership, and traveling around. And um, an interesting thing was uh, I, I had a uh, one bad accident, and I, I, do, I don't try to drive at night in Laos because uh, you have these big water buffaloes that are just black as, as the night, and you have these big hogs that are black as the night, and they'll come and lay on the road, the tarmac, to soak up, soak up the warmth, and and keep themselves warm. And uh, uh, we got a guy with a loudspeaker. I don't know what he's saying. Propaganda, something about the government. So. All right, pardon the interruption. So, um, so I try to avoid riding at night only because of, of I just didn't want to. Man, you don't want to hit a buffalo at night, and they're just pitch dark. You don't see them until the last minute. But this one particular night, I had miscalculated where I needed to go and the church I was going to meet in the pa underground pastor. And uh, I found myself up in the mountains driving at night, 
and I came around the bend, and this guy was in my lane in a big old truck. He saw me, drove me right off the side. I went right off the side into about 12, 15 foot gully of rocks. I remember bouncing around my bike, bouncing around, I remember my head hitting rocks. I remember just crying out, Jesus, help me, save me. And uh, I, I was kind of splayed out, you know, and, and afterwards I'm checking my fingers, you know, my toes, making sure everything's working, nothing's broken, you know, I cried out for help. The truck driver just kept going. He didn't stop, he knew what he had done. He just kept on going. Well, I didn't know, but down the road, there were a couple of guys that uh, were a work crew and they heard the accident. So they come with a lantern and they find me down in the ditch and they help pick me up. And uh, they get me up on the road and they take off my clothes to kind of see if, make sure there aren't bones sticking out, nothing broken, everything's fine, I was fine. The only problem I had is I had a, I didn't know if I broke my thumb or sprained it, it was real sore, I had a little tenderness in my shoulder, but other than that, I, I really was fine. But I was more concerned about my bike. So they get down, they get the bike up, they pull the bike up, um, you know, and we check out the bike and look at the bike and um, the bike starts right up. And other than the, the handlebars being a bit skewed and the brake was pushed down, we could push that up a little bit. Bike ran fine, worked fine, everything was fine. I did a figure eight, it was all fine. So I went over and I grabbed my guys that helped me. They were like my good Samaritans. I gave them a big old hug and a big old kiss. They, they, I didn't understand them, they didn't understand me, but they knew that I was so happy and appreciative of them helping me. And while I held them and hugged them, I just prayed a prayer that God would bless them, help them, open their eyes, minister to them, send someone that would speak the gospel to them. And uh, you know, again, we didn't understand each other, but they certainly understood. I appreciated what they did and I cared about what they did. So I carried on, you know, got into the city that I was supposed to be at, uh, found a place to stay, a guest house, got up in the morning and I uh, went looking for a place for breakfast and uh, there was a motorcycle and in uh, it's one place where I went and uh, there's a well-dressed loud gentleman as I pulled up and he was admiring my bike and he actually spoke pretty good English. So I said to him, I said, um, I, I, I need a, a mechanic. Do you know a mechanic, a, a good mechanic? that can help me. I've got some things on my bike that need to be fixed. And he smiled, he looked, he said, yeah, my best friend's the best mechanic in town. He's right across the street. So we went across the street, he introduced me. I told him where I was. He said, yeah, I'll come over and fix your bike. So I went and sat down and had breakfast. And there was an Australian couple there. And as strange as this may sound, I just looked at the lady and uh, they were traveling Laos as tourists. I said, you don't happen to be a nurse. And she said, "Why, well, yes, I am. So I explained I had an accident. I didn't know how I broke my thumb, sprained it. So she looked at it, examined it. She says, no, you, you may have strained it and pulled it, but it's not broken, you're gonna be fine, which I was relieved because I needed that hand and I you know, wouldn't be able to continue if I had to get a, a cast on it. And so uh, later the mechanic comes over and he's working on my bike, fixing my bike. He fixes everything that's wrong, adjusts it, and uh, charges me the equivalent of two US dollars. I thought, oh, this is fantastic. I'm having a great breakfast. Then another couple, Australian couple comes up and a fat boy Harley, and they're touring Asia. And uh, so this guy's very friendly, he's written books. And so we get talking and chatting. And so I told him what had happened to me. So he he started giving me advice about how to ride. He, he taught me some things about riding that again, being a novice and no one instructed me, I didn't know. And he said, Ed, you know, when you go into a, cor a, a, a corner, he said, just, just lean the bike, just lean. Let the, the, the gravity will turn, you don't have to turn the wheel. Cause I was just kind of, driving so safe. I was just trying to stay alive. And I said, you mean I don't have to turn the wheel? He said, no, you just kind of just lean into it and the, the, the bike will do the rest. And I, I looked at him, I said, you know, I'm going to tell you, I, I, I'm going to follow your advice. And if, if I go off the cliff and I die, I'm going to haunt you the rest of my life. And he laughed, I laughed. But yet it, the advice he gave me was the best advice. It changed everything from riding. He taught me how to lay my fingers across the, the brake and the clutch and use that instead of reach out and grab them. So all the tips he gave me just changed everything. Now I had lost my gloves when I crashed, couldn't find them and everything. And he happened to have a brand new set of Harley Davidson leather gloves, which I wear today. You'll see me on the videos. And he had them and they fit me perfectly. And I thought to myself, wow, God, you're so good. You provide a great place to get a good American breakfast. You provide a nurse to check me out. You bring a guy to give me riding advice. You send a mechanic to fix my bike. I'm good to go. I said, I, you couldn't get this kind of service in the United States. So I was so blessed. I was so happy. It was a great day and I carried on. Now, God began to open up doors all over Laos and the underground church. And uh, I'll share more about that in, in my next video.
and I'm gonna tell you a story about how a case of beer set me free. So you're following these videos, you don't wanna miss the next one. God bless you guys. Thank you for tuning in. I certainly do appreciate all the love coming my way. Your prayers and your support, they mean a whole lot to me. We'll talk soon.